Super. Wow, what a, it's such a delight to see so many men out on a Saturday morning. God bless you gentlemen. Thank you for being here, uh, for, for inputting into your life and uh, making spiritual growth a, a priority. And so uh, this morning, if you have a Bible with you, uh, we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6. But since Jamie introduced me as being a funny guy, I better tell a funny story. So there's, uh, how many of you are ready for spring? Any golfers here? Anybody do any? Okay, so there's this guy. He goes golfing, <laughs> and he takes his wife. They're, they're golfing. It's something that they can do together. <clears throat> he hits a ball slightly out of bounds behind a barn that bordered the golf course. And so he's like, oh, man, this is going to kill my game. He goes out, and his wife looks. She goes, hey, honey, look, this door on this end of the barn is open, the other door, and you can see straight through the barn to the green. And she said, I won't count any penalty strokes against you. He said, I, you know what? I'm feeling a little bit uh, spry today. So he, he, gets, he addresses the ball, and uh, he, he takes a good, good swing at it. Unfortunately, he mishit just a little bit. The ball hits the door frame going on the one side of the barn, bounces back, hits his wife right in the middle of the forehead. She dies. They have a funeral. He goes through a time of recovery. About a year later, he decided he's ready to go golfing again. Goes out with a couple of his buddies, and lo and behold, he comes to that hole, and he mishits the ball, and it lands in the same spot. He goes up to the ball, and his friend said, you know, the door on this end is open, and the other door on the other end of the barn is open, and we can see the green from here. He said, hey, hey, hey. I've learned my lesson. I will never do that again. He said, why not? He said, the last time I hit, tried to hit a shot through that barn, I got a seven on the hole. <laughs> the theme of our conference this morning, is: if, if it takes a while to get it, you'll enjoy it later. So go ahead and enjoy that is get in the game. And this morning I want to talk about being a man of God. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6, this is what the Bible says. And he said to him, look now, there is in this city a man of God. And he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way we should go. Father, I pray that you will take this word, plant it in our hearts, and that which grows from it, may it be men of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me give you a little background to this verse. There's a man named Kish, and he lost his donkeys. This doesn't seem terribly relevant to us today, but in this day, animals were part of their economy. It was part of their source of income. It was an investment. It was part of their workforce. And so to lose several donkeys would be a financial hit and hardship to the one who lost them. So Kish sends his son Saul you know that name because later Saul would become the first king in Israel. Saul goes out to find the animals. And after covering a lot of territory, Saul is about to give up. His reason was this. We've been gone so long that dad is going to be more worried about us than his lost donkeys. So they're about ready to to, to, to give up, but Saul's servant that was searching for these donkeys with him, he has an idea, and that is the one that we just read in, in chapter 9, verse 6. There's a man of God, he said, in this city. He's an honorable man. What he says surely comes to pass. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. What is it? What is this? What is a man of God? What does that look like? There are a lot of people, a lot of males who spend part of their life or a significant part of their life trying to figure this thing out. What does it mean to be a man? 
We know that it has more to do with just male genitalia. What does it mean to be a real man? Who are you? What kind of a man are you? It was told that uh, a Jewish rabbi was being uh, questioned by KGB police during the Cold War and they were harassing people of religious persuasions and one of the KGB officers came up to the Jewish rabbi and said, who are you and what are you doing? The Jewish rabbi looked at the KGB officer and said, if I paid you, will you follow me and every day of my life ask me those two questions? Who are you? And what are you doing? What kind of a man are you? What kind of a man are you becoming? Until the day we go to see Jesus, we're still becoming. We're still growing. We're still heading in a trajectory. Today our theme is get in the game. What a great challenge. But before you get in the game, there are some questions we have to ask ourselves. You have to consider, are you prepared? Do you possess the basic skill set? Are you sufficiently motivated? What do you have that you will pass along? Are you in the game? So let's look at three things out of this passage of Scripture. First of all, I want to talk about character. It'll be the first blank you can fill in on your paper if you're doing that this morning. Let's talk about character. And it's encapsulated in this short phrase, man of God. You know, people in our culture today are superficially impressed by a man of the world. People who are men who are popular or powerful or virile. But when it's important, people follow a man of character. What kind of a man are you? What are you known for? What are you known for by your family? by your work associates, by those closest to you, those who have a glimpse into the real you. I want to talk about three characteristics of a man of God, a godly man. First of all, a godly man is a moral man. A godly man is a moral man. We have been created after the image of God. And when we're born again, that broken image is restored. So in Genesis 1.26, we, we see in God's creation when he made man, he made man after his image. He wasn't talking about a physical image or a likeness. God doesn't have that kind of an image. He was talking about the internal stuff, moral attributes, character. When we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the apostle Paul says, For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So if you've been born again, if you're a follower of Jesus, God has a predestined will for your life and for mine. He wants us to be an expression in this world of who he is. Moral character. Our culture today is sadly lacking and greatly confused when it comes to moral character. Men of God, people of faith, those who are followers of Jesus, we have this mandate. We must be moral men. Can you say amen? amen. Second of all, a man of God is going to be a fruitful man. And I want to, I want to work that fruitful term to fruit filled. Galatians 5, and 23 is the, to me, it is a core set of attributes. If you have the spirit of God living inside of you, and if you've been born again, he moves in. And if he lives in us, then some stuff ought to grow out of our life. And Paul identifies that in Galatians 5, and 23, the fruit of the spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the attributes of any spirit-filled follower of Jesus. 
If we talk about being a godly man, then these nine skill sets, if you will, will be growing in our life. We will cause other people to feel more loved as a, as a result of being a part of their life. That's the fruit of the Spirit. We will contribute to other people's joy because the Spirit of God is at work within us. We will contribute to other people's general sense of peace. A godly man brings these to the table. He's a moral man. He's a fruit-filled man. And thirdly, a godly man is a spiritual man. The early church was uh, uh, facing their first major hurdle. There was a complaint. Can you imagine it in church? There was a complaint. And when the complaint arose, it, it, the, the core issue was there was one group who felt neglected. Their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the apostles are like, we don't really have time for this. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So they said to the church, choose you out from among yourselves. Listen to it. Acts 6.3. Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. I love those three things. Good reputation. Let me ask you. We go back to that. Do you have a good reputation? Sometimes we say, I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. We ought to care what other people think about us. To some degree, not that I'm going to live my life on the basis of other people's values, that's not what we're talking about, but when I'm living a godly life, I'm going to have, generally speaking, a good reputation. Find men with a good reputation, full of the Spirit of God, and wisdom, common sense. You know, those things don't go counter to each other. I love this. There is a man of God in that city. There's a man of God in that family. There's a man of God in that neighborhood. There's a man of God in that workplace. Are you that kind of man? Are you in the game? We're going to talk about, we've talked about character. Now let's turn to integrity. He is an honorable man. How many of you have learned it's not what you say, but what you do that makes you honorable? Many believe that you can get by by saying what you believe. If you have the right set of beliefs, then that's what really counts. Well, beliefs are important, for they tend to, to determine the trajectory of your life, but beliefs that do not affect behavior are meaningless. They're hollow. And so I want you to ask yourself this question, am I a man who behaves honorably? Am I a man who behaves honorably? I want to talk about the two selves that are expressed in our lives. Let's talk first about the private self. Who are you when you think nobody is watching? Or when nobody is monitoring? Or when you're really not accountable? I love, and I'm not going to show the, the clip this, this morning, but... I love the, the movie um, Saving Private Ryan. And at the very end of that movie, Private Ryan is an older man. He's, a, he's, he's aged and he's visiting Normandy and, and his comrades who fell in battle trying to save him. And his wife joins him at the tombstone of uh, Captain Miller and he looks to his wife and he, he, he says these words. He said, am I a good man? Have I led a good life? She's rather taken back by the question and she says, what? Of 
course you're a good man. He had received a mandate the day his life was saved on a bridge when Captain Miller grabs him and says, earn this. The sacrifice for your life, he was saying, live a good life to earn this. Well, how many of you know we've been saved? Somebody died in our place. We didn't deserve it, and we can't possibly earn it, but we can live a life that reflects that sacrifice. Would you dare to ask your children or your wife to speak plainly to you and ask these questions, am I an honorable man? To your wife or to your children, do you feel honored by me? by the way I treat you? Do I bring honor to God by the way that I conduct my life, make decisions, express myself to you? Our private self will, in, in, in many respects, determine our public self. The way that we conduct ourselves in front of others. How many of you know our personality leaks? Doesn't it? Uh, 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 case in point, have you ever, uh, I don't know why I did this, I can't remember what activity it was, but did you ever put water in a bag and carry it? A, a paper bag. It works. You can fill up a paper bag with water and carry it for about a minute or less. Now, it'll carry for so long, but what, what starts to happen? The, the fibers of the paper get saturated, and the glue that holds the bag together deteriorates. It starts leaking. And it's not very long before the bottom just falls out. And I sometimes I look at our, at our personalities, at my personality. I look at my own self and I leak. Freud called it, a, uh, they've come to call it a Freudian slip. That sometimes the things that we're trying to suppress and press down and hide and keep under submission and subjection, they leak out. Let it be known here and now that this whole thing of becoming a godly man is a lifelong journey of becoming. None of us have reached it. We're not there. We're going to keep growing, and to be sure, the flesh, the world, and the devil are going to keep us on our knees and on our face before God along this journey. The way to be honorable, gentlemen, is to give honor. That's the way you get an honorable reputation. If I want to be an honorable man, I, in front of my family, I should honor my wife. I don't talk down to her. I don't, I don't because I'm physically larger and stronger. <laughs> I, I chuckle at that because that, that's, that, that's funny to me because I still have to go to sleep. <laughs> My wife, I, I'm convinced if I ever acted up too much, <laughs> I'd wake up with a knot on my head. <laughs> That's besides the point. If I want to be honored by my wife, the best way to ensure that that might happen is to honor her. Husbands, Peter says, dwell with your wife with understanding. Listen to what he says, giving honor to her. I had a friend who was a missionary. He was a dentist in the Philippines. His name was Dr. John Balakoski. John was a dentist. He said, but I do surgery too. <laughs> in the Philippines, when you need a doctor, you need a doctor. You don't care what their specialty is. And so he was saying, from time to time in Manila, he said, I could always tell when the Americans were on the bus because they're loud, boisterous, boastful, full of themselves, embarrassing. We have a whole culture to fight. We not only have the flesh to fight, but 
we have this, this idea that we have certain rights. You know the biggest right I have in, in, in my world? My biggest right is to love other people like Jesus loved. That's where my, that's about it. I know we have politics and I know we have opinions and, and we're, we're very uh, uh, staunch about how we feel about these things. But never let politics dictate your religion. Oh, I'm off track. So we talked about character. He's a man of God. We're talking about integrity. To have a reputation of being honorable. That doesn't happen by accident. What happens by accident is we make big mistakes. The default setting uh, in our nature is depravity. And so if we do not conscientiously purpose in our heart to track in the, in the, in the direction of godliness, it isn't going to happen. Number three, credibility. Number three, credibility. All that he says surely comes to pass. It is a huge value to be, if you're going to be a, a godly man, if you're going to be a man of God, you have to be a man of your word. My word is my bond. What I say is what I mean. And what I mean is what I say. And part of this is being willing to make commitments. Being willing to make commitments and bent on keeping my commitments. But today, it's, it, we live in a culture of convenience. And if something better happens along, well then, that's what we do. We jump off of our commitments and onto the something better that comes along. I have to brag on a, a guy, he was in churches when we were having church on Sunday nights, my goodness, and uh, uh, things were different then. And he just kind of pulled me aside and I said, hey man, I th it's good to see you tonight. And he said, I, I don't want to pat on the back, but yes I do. <laughs> he said, I got a call this morning that I could get two tickets to the Steeler game that was played this afternoon at 4.30. And I had to tell my friend, no, I'm going to be in church tonight because I made a commitment. Wow. Hey, I don't know about out this way, but in Pittsburgh, Steeler tickets? That's like gold, buddy. That's a, that, that, does, uh, that doesn't happen very often. A true man of God can be depended upon. He is dependable. Let me tell you a quick story. Bernie. Bernie Riccosi, uh, he was a foreman one of the management people in a mine. And he was, uh, it was a godsend because it's funny how this happened. I, our church was growing. People were getting saved literally every week. People were getting saved and the base was growing faster than the structure. And it was, it was, it was hard to keep up with. And, and in order to properly disciple People. Do you know what I mean by disciple people? Help them along becoming better followers of Jesus. In order to properly disciple people, you need mentors. You need, it's not just telling people the right things, it's showing them. And so I, I, I prayed and I said, Lord, we're in a bit of a fix. I need some guys to transfer here <laughs> that are out of the box ready. And Bernie showed up. And, and I knew Bernie's brother uh, just casually, and, and Bernie came to us from one of our larger churches up north, and he said, uh, Pastor, my work is transferring me. And this was after church. He said, I've come to church now. It's going to be a couple months before I get here. But I want you to know I've served as a deacon. Deacon means servant. 
He said, I've served as a deacon at our church. And when I come, I know it'll take time for me to be embraced. But I will serve with you when I come. You know what I'm saying as a pastor? Yeah, right. We'll never see him again. But Bernie showed up two months later. And Bernie plugged in. We served side by side. We had a men's ministry. It was rocking. All of our deacons and our leaders in the church came out of our men's ministry because it was, it was, it was doing what it should do, mentoring other men who were new in the Lord. So we were seeing men get saved. They were growing in their faith. And Bernie was just one of those guys who plugged right into men's ministry, started serving. We continued to see men get saved. And he was, soon he was teaching a Sunday school class because he had been around long enough. He was, he was, he was just a great helper. And then he's, he was nominated like within two years to be part of our, our board, our deacons. And, and uh, the first meeting when Bernie showed up, he, he stood at the table and he said to the other guys, he said, men, I just want you to know I'm here to serve the Lord and serve our pastor and I'm going to be his greatest advocate and that is my purpose for being here. Wow. And he was. One of the greatest things that emerged out of Bernie's ministry in our church he wasn't a suck up and it wasn't that kind of a thing he contributed to a culture of cooperation we served together our board we were best buddies we enjoyed each other's company and we served the Lord and the church just kept growing and growing and people kept getting saved and it was a wonderful thing and, and the reason I reference Bernie was because he was a man of his word. He said he was going to help, and he helped. He said he was going to serve, and he served. He was dependable. He's, he was one of, just one of my, my best friends. How can you not be best friends with a guy like that? How about you? Let's bring this in for a landing. Let's go to the next slide, please. Perhaps he can show us the way we should go. You know what, guys? There are people, they're watching you. They watch you wash your car. They watch how you do life. They're watching you. And they need leadership. They'll follow somebody. Do you provide a model that's worth following? Are you a godly man? I, I, I think of a, a guy named Richard, and his testimony was, he said, I used to sit at home, and I watched buses go by my front door every week. They were green and white, ugly buses. And it said Calvary Assembly on the side. He said, I used to laugh at those people. Every week, it would, they'd go by about 8 o'clock in the morning, and he said, that fool gets up early on a Sunday morning. He said, I'd be out washing my car. And he said, but you know what? I watched it week after week after week, the bus driver going by, picking up screaming kids and taking them to Sunday school. And he said, eventually, I had to go to that church to figure out why that guy would get up every Sunday morning and hang out with a busload of screaming kids. And Dick Terman got saved. And it was only a couple of years. You know what he was doing? Yeah, he was driving that bus. Let's go to the next video clip. Epilogue. Who are you leading? An older men who are going to come to the faith. Huck was given those boys that he beat up his speech on what it is to be a man. Not just a speech. Our best speech is the life we live. Are you a godly man? Am I? 
Am I further down the tracks than I was last year in becoming a better godly man? Let's pray. So, Lord, we look to you for your help and ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus that you would do a work through us. Give us character. Give us integrity. Make us honorable. May we be dependable, men of our word, credible. Help us, I pray, to get in the game and be what you've called us to be. Would you stand with me? I'd like to wrap this session up. We only have a minute or two. Would you move to the altar this morning with me? Come forward. And let's rededicate ourselves to this purpose. Lord, make me to be the man of God you have designed for me to be. Would you pray that prayer with me? Let's seek God to that end. Would you make me to have the character I need to have? Would you instill in me the integrity that brings honor to your name? My public self, may it be credible and an accurate reflection of a true follower of Jesus. Would you lead us in a chorus that we could worship to as we make this commitment?